वेलकम टू दिस इंडियन पॉलिटी बाय एम लक्ष्मीकांत आई एम बाबू गुणशेखरन फैकल्टी पॉलिटी एंड गवर्नेंस स्टडी आई क्यू इंग्लिश आई हैव सिक्योर्ड ऑल इंडिया रैंक 337 इन सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन 2016 एंड सिंस देन एंड इवन बिफोर दैट आई हैव बीन मेंटरिंग एंड हेल्पिंग द स्टूडेंट्स प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर द सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन the idea behind making this particular series on indian polity by m lakshmikanth is to help the students who are preparing for civil service examination 2024 and after and it is not only to help the students preparing for civil service examination 2024 but also students who are preparing for the other competitive examination in our previous lectures we have tried to understand the basic concepts like what is constitution what is constitutionalism what is difference between the written and unwritten constitution the salient features of the indian constitution and then some of the key words which is mentioned in the constitution and related to the subject indian polity so we'll continue our lecture and we'll move on to the next topic that is the historical background in today's class in the last class you also taken up the making of the indian constitution we understood as to what led to the establishment of the constituent assembly and subsequently how the constituent assembly functioned and how they drafted the indian constitution and how they gave effect to the indian constitution as a continuation of that particular topic now we'll move on to the next topic that is the historical background of all the topics in the indian polity by m lakshmikanth this historical background is little heavy topic i would say it has a lot of facts not much things per se which is to understand but you have to remember a lot of information so we take this particular topic a little slower i would make a little shorter video so that it would help the students to assimilate the information so i'll try to understand this particular historical background the possibility of the questions coming from this particular topic is very minimal but you cannot rule out the fact that uh, they cannot ask you question from this particular topic sometimes there can be a question in the preliminary examination maximum of one question not more than that sometimes they can ask you questions in the mains examination also once there was a question from the government of india act 1935 so probably there is a possibility that they can ask you question that's why we cannot skip this particular topic as well so what exactly is this historical background The Constitution of India came into force on twenty six January nineteen fifty. This is a historic document drafted by the Constituent Assembly. The Constituent Assembly, which was established based on the Cabinet Mission Plan in nineteen forty six, and subsequently this Constituent Assembly has worked around three years. To be very specific, two years, eleven months, and eighteen days to draft this particular Constitution. in fact one of the criticism to our constitution is that it is a borrowed constitution is that there is not much original about this particular constitution and in in fact many provisions of the indian constitution has been ransacked from the various other constitutions of the world in fact it is also true that the constituent assembly has studied more than 60 constitutions of the world and it has borrowed a number of provisions from those constitution and then subsequently they drafted the indian constitution but however it is also true even today the bulk of the indian constitution is from the government of india act 1935 a law which was passed by the british parliament based on which india was ruled not only till 1947 when india got independence but even after the indian independence till the time india had its own constitution so how this government of india act 1935 came about the government of india act 1935 did not come in one single day it's a process of gradual evolution which has happened over a period of time and gradually and slowly a number of constitutional reforms have happened over a period of time and this evolution has happened over a period of 200 years and finally it culminated in the government of india act 1935 and if you look into how the britishers ruled india the britishers ruled india under two eras one you can say that to be the company rule and then the crown rule the company rule was a time from 1773 till the year 1857 and that is a time when the british india was administered by the east india company on behalf of the british government 
on behalf of the crown and then subsequent 1857 after the revolt of 1857 which is also called as a sipai mutiny the administration was directly taken up by the british crown and that is all that is the time when the british india was administered directly by the crown that is by the british government and that continued from 1858 till 1947 and which is spanning almost a period of 200 years a number of constitutional reforms has been brought in by the britishers to administer the british india and gradually and steadily the tools of representative form of governance emerged in our country the tools like democratic form of governance emerged in our country now all these step by step evolution has resulted in the government of india act 1935 and today a bulk of the constitution of india is derived from the government of india act 1935 and to that extent this topic is very important for us to understand how this gradual reforms have happened over a period of time and this is exactly what we are going to study under the historical background or the historical underpinnings so let us take it very slowly and gradually so let us try to understand as to what is the background behind as to how the britishers came to india so the first topic that you are going to understand is it is not only the britishers who made inroads into india as traders but a number of european countries came into india in fact the british was not the first to come to india starting 15th century 1498 was godagama came to india from portuguese and he came as a trader and subsequently to portuguese the dutch came and then the british also followed then the danish and then the french came so they all came to india and they knew that the wealth of india and the trade potential that they had with india and one by one they came to india and subsequently among all the european uh, countries that came to india the british was successful the british was successful in staying in india for a long period of time initially as traders starting the 17th century almost till the mid of 17th century in 8 sorry 18th century for 150 years as traders and then for the next 200 years they started ruling india for the first 100 years through the east india company and then the next 100 years almost directly by the british crown so almost they had their influence in india for 350 years 150 years as traders and 200 years they controlled india and they exercised political power over india and during this time a lot of developments have happened and which gradually resulted in the government of india act 1935 and subsequently it also influenced the constitution of india so this is exactly what we are going to study under this particular topic if you see how the britishers came to india the britishers came to india as traders and the britishers to be very specific the east india company which came to india as the traders was given the right by queen elizabeth 1 and because of the charter right which was guaranteed by queen elizabeth 1 which provided a monopoly to the east india company and with this monopoly rights the east india company came as traders and they started trading in our country and starting the 17th century they understood that india is full of wealth it is rich in spices and rich in other forms of resources and the trade was highly profitable the britishers are always looking for an opportunity to also have a political establishment in our country and to politically also to control our country and wherein for them the opportunity has happened in the form of what is called as battle of plassey even before that there were small wars but battle of plassey was considered to be a remarkable change in the way that the britishers were looking at india initially only as traders and after the battle of plassey where they defeated the nawab of bengal they tried to influence their political control over india as well and after battle of plassey the next subsequent battle was the battle of buxar in 1765 where the britishers defeated the combined force of nawab of bengal and the nawab of awadh and also the shah alam 2 who was a mughal emperor at that point of time and subsequently they also got the diwani rights from the shah alam 
Diwani rights means that they had the right to collect the taxes. And that is when they started asserting their political control over India for the first time in the year 1765. And this Battle of Buxar turned to be the turning point in the history of India, before which they were only the traders and now they also tried to control the territory of India and East India Company become really powerful after the Battle of Buxar. After the Diwani rights, they started collecting the taxes in our country. And what has happened over a period of time, on the one hand, the East India Company officials were becoming richer and richer. And in fact, the wealth that they amassed over a period of time was very high. But on the other hand, the company was making losses. And the East India Company was reporting losses to the British government. Because the East India Company had monopoly rights to trade with India on the fact that they have to pay a certain element of royalty to the British government, to the crown which they failed to do because they said that they are not able to make the profit and the company is going through the losses. But on the other hand, the company officials were making huge uh, money. They're making huge uh, revenue for themselves. And the British Parliament then realized that there is something which is really wrong with the affairs of the company. And the British Parliament appointed a secret committee to study this particular matter. And this particular committee of the British Parliament recommended that it is time to regulate the affairs of the company. And that is when the British Parliament came out with the act which is called as the Regulating Act of 1773. And the Regulating Act of 1773 was the first step that is taken by the British Parliament to regulate the affairs of East India Company and also to some way to influence the control over the British India through the East India Company. And starting 1773, the Regulating Act, till the year 1857, the British India was administered by the East India Company through the, the British Crown started administering India, but through the East India Company. It is the East India Company which was having the control over the territory and the army and the revenue, everything in British India. So this was the era which is called as the Company Rule. So the Company Rule is from 1773 till the year 1857. In 1857, after the Sipai mutiny, then the British government realized that this is the time that they have to directly take up the administration and not through the East India Company. And from 1858, where the Government of India Act was passed by the British Parliament, 1858 till 1947, till the time they gave the independence, the British India was directly administered by the British government in the name of Crown. And the subsequent legislations was passed by the British Parliament to regulate the affairs in India. And this was a time which is also called as the Crown Rule. And then finally, we got the independence in 1947. And this independence or the Indian Independence Act, which provided the sovereignty to the Constant Assembly of India to draft the constitution in the way that we want. And ultimately, the Constant Assembly of India drafted the Indian constitution which was adopted on 26 November 1949 and finally came into force on 26 January 1950. This constitution of India had a bulk of the constitution from the government of India Act 1935, which gradually has evolved over a period of time. And that's why this historical background become, becomes relevant in understanding the constitution of India. So we'll proceed further. We'll try to understand basically as to how these developments have gradually happened over a period of time. So before we proceed further, we will have to have a scheme work of things as to what we are going to study under this particular topic. So if you talk of historical background, the way that the administration in India during the British India has progressed, it can be classified into two types, the historical background, one is as we already seen. One is the company rule, and other is the crown rule. One is the company rule, which is from 1773 to 1857, and then we have the crown rule from 1857 or 1858 till 1947, 
till the time India got independence. So, what are the various acts that was passed during this particular time which we are going to study under this particular topic. So, the company rule starts with the regulating act. Regulating Act 1773, and then there was Act of Settlement, seventeen eighty one. Then we had the Pitts India Act, Pitt the Younger, the youngest Prime Minister of India, William Pitt. So he made certain reforms, seventeen eighty four. Act of 1786, then we have the Charter Acts, we have four Charter Acts starting 1793 and then 1813, 1833 and 1853. So these are the various Charter Acts that you are going to understand. And all these acts are part of what is called as the company rule. And then in 1857, after the Charter Act of 1853 was passed, in fact, we will understand the Charter Act of 1853 was not willing to provide the further extension for a specific time period for the company to the East India Company to administer. And then it did not give a fixed time limit. And then the act provides that you can carry out the administration in India as long as. Uh, the parliament makes a law and take up the administration. And in the meantime, what has happened that in 1857, the, uh, the, the Sipai mutiny has happened in our country. And then subsequently, the British parliament thought that this is time that we will take up the administration and uh, no longer the, the East India Company would carry out the administration in India, but rather it will be taken up by the parliament itself. It will be taken up by the British crown. And that is when they passed the Government of India Act 1858. So, the Crown rule will start from the Government of India Act 1858. And then from the Government of India Act, they had a few reforms in the Indian Council. So, the Indian Council Act. Council Act 1862. Indian Council Act. 1862, you have the Indian Council Act 1891 and then the Indian Council Act 1909 and then you have the Government of India Act 1919 and then you have the Government of India Act 1935 and then finally you have the Indian Independence Act 1947. So, these are the historical background and these are the legislations that you will have to understand which finally led to the independence of India and India having its own constitution. So, number of uh, factual information that you have to go through and that is the reason I th said that we will take up this particular topic very slowly. So, first thing we will start is we will start with the company rule which starts from 1773 to 1857. So, in the company rule the first thing that we will see is the regulating act of 1773. So, come to the first one that is the Regulating Act 1773. As I already said, what is the reason to bring in this particular legislation? Why the British Parliament has passed this particular law? It is based on the recommendation which is given by a secret committee in the British Parliament that there is a need to regulate the affairs of the company. On the one hand, the company is showing losses, but on the other hand, the employees are making more profits, the officials are making more money. And that is because of a lot of corrupt activities that is happening in the East India Company. So, it is time to regulate the East India Company. This recommendation was accepted and the British Parliament passed the Regulating Act. 
And what was the significance of this particular regulating act? This was the first step that was taken by the British Parliament to regulate the affairs of East India Company. So, before that, there was no step, although the right was guaranteed to the East India Company to have monopoly rights over the trade with India, but never ever they have taken any effort to regulate the affairs of the East India Company. And this is the first time they tried to regulate the affairs of East India Company, despite the fact that the East India Company has now also acquired the territorial, territorial rights over India after the Battle of Buxar. So, they started uh, to regulate the affairs of the company. And this is also the act for the first time recognized the political and the administrative functions of the East India Company. So, before that, the East India Company was just a trading company which was there in India. But after the Battle of Buxar, it was not only having the uh, commercial functions in India, but it was also having the political and the administrative functions to administer the territory of India, to collect the revenue and other political affairs to maintain the army. So, everything has been now recognized by the British Parliament under this Regulating Act of 1773. And in fact, this is the first step that was taken by the British Parliament to provide for more central administration in India. So, before the Regulating Act of 1773, the administration of the East India Company in India was never centralized. There are multiple provinces, sorry, multiple presidencies in our, uh, in British India and the presidencies include the presidencies of Bombay, presidents of Madras and Bengal and it was never centralized. So, they were uh, functioning independently. But for the first time, the British Parliament through the Regulating Act said that now on we are going to centralize the administration and they said that uh, the and in fact all the presidencies, I said the presidencies of uh, Bombay, the presidents of Madras and the presidency of uh, Kolkata, all these presidencies were having different uh, governor, uh, they were having different governors and these governors are like the executive officers who would carry out the administration on behalf of the East India Company. And now the Regulating Act of 1773 said that we are going to centralize the administration in India and how we are going to centralize the administration now in India. They said that the governor of Bengal, the governor of Bengal would be designated as the governor general of Bengal. So, till that point of time, there is no designation called as a governor general. Each and every province, each and every presidencies were having their own governors. And for the first time, the governor of Bengal was designated as what? The governor of Bengal is designated as the governor general of Bengal. And the governor general of Bengal would carry out the administration for the entire British India. And how would he carry out the administration? He would carry out the administration through an executive council. A four member executive council was provided by the Regulating Act and they would advise the Governor General of Bengal in carrying out the administration. And we also said that it has been centralizing the administration in our country. So, what this particular act has done is it has subordinated the other governors that is the Governor of Bombay and the Governor of Madras Presidencies to the Governor General of Bengal. Earlier they were independent of one another. Now, who is superior among all the three governors? It is the Governor General of Bengal. But despite the fact that there would be a separate governor to Madras presidency and to the Bombay presidency, but to some extent you can understand that they have to report to now the governor general of Bengal. And the governor general of Bengal is one who is to carry out the administration of the entire uh, British India. And uh, you can say that this governor general of Bengal is none other than it is similar to that of the chief executive officer. Suppose let us assume that this East India Company. East India Company is the company which is having the political control over India and it requires a CEO and the CEO is nothing but the Governor General of Bengal. And he is going to implement the decisions that is taken by the East India Company and the East India Company was controlled by the Court of Directors. So, if you take a company, there will be board of directors. So, similarly, the board of directors who are responsible to the British Parliament with regard to the affairs of East India Company is the court of directors. And the CEO who is appointed is the Governor General of Bengal. And the other governors, that is the Governor of Bombay and the Governor of uh, Madras, they are all subordinated now to the Governor General of Bengal. 
and what else has been done by the regulating act so the regulating act made sure that they prohibit the government servants from engaging in any private trade or accepting bribes or gifts from the native people because they found that this is one of the reason as to why on the one hand the government the uh, company officials amassed a lot of wealth insane wealth in fact but at the same time the company is incurring a lot of loss because of all these accepting of bribe and other form of corrupt practices which the uh, regulating act of 1773 tried to prohibit and in addition to that the regulating act also established the supreme court of india in calcutta and the very objective is that they wanted to bring in the british legal system the administration of justice to the people according to the british legal system and the supreme court of india which is established in kolkata would now have uh, the matters will take up matters related to both the civil as well as the criminal matters and they would start administering justice to the people and the supreme court which was established would have both uh, uh, the original and the appellate jurisdiction with regard to original and the appellate jurisdiction original and appellate jurisdiction with regard to both the civil and the criminal matters but however the administration of justice would happen only in accordance with the british legal system as per the regulating act of 1773 which we will understand later has created uh, some problem and to do with this particular problem the act of settlement was passed in 1781 which we will discuss subsequently so the supreme court was to have both original as well as the appellate jurisdiction original means the matter can directly come to the supreme court Appellate means uh, from the provincial uh, courts, it can come to the Supreme Court. So, both the powers were given to the Supreme Court of India. And further, if you see that this uh, uh, regulating act of 1773, which also strengthened the control of the British government over the company requiring the court of directors. As I already said, the court of directors are like the board of directors for the company to report on its revenue, civil and the military affairs of India. Before this, the British Parliament was not concerned about as to how the East India Company is managed by their court of directors. But now, they have been uh, making losses and they have been defaulting on the payment that they have made to the British government. Now, the Parliament wanted to regulate the affairs of the East India Company. In fact, remember I said that uh, the East India Company was having the monopoly trading rights in India which was guaranteed, which was granted by the Queen Elizabeth and subsequently this right kept on extending. And to keep up this monopoly rights with India, the East India Company has to pay a certain amount of royalty to the government every year, a very huge amount. And the Regulating Act 1773 was brought in in the first place and because that the company was defaulting on the royalty and the payment it has to make to the government. Not only that they defaulted in the payment that they have to make to the government, but they also was looking for a loan from the government and from the biggest bank in uh, Br Britain at that point of time. And that is when the parliament realized, now this is time to regulate the affairs of East India Company. And then they uh, appointed a specific committee and that committee in the parliament recommended that you will have to go for a regulating act. And the recommendations has been accepted and they brought in all these regulations. They had a grip over uh, by regulating, uh, by passing this particular act. The parliament wanted to have a grip over the affairs of the company and they had control over the court of directors. And the court of directors have to report them with regard to the revenue, the civil and the military administration as to what happens in India to the British government. So the regulating act was the first step that the British parliament has taken to keep some kind of control over the East India Company as to how the East India Company is administering India. And subsequently what has happened is there were few flaws in this Regulating Act 1773 which they realized and they also thought that it is time to do away with these flaws and subsequently they amended this particular act in the year 1781 and that came to be what is called as the Amending Act of 1781 or it is called as an act of settlement. Why it is called as an act of settlement? Because there are few disputes that arise out of this regulating act of 1773 was settled uh, by the amending act of 1781 and that is why it is also called as the amending act because by, the amend by amending the 1773 act they are trying to resolve this particular dispute. So, it is also called as the amending act of 1781 or the act of settlement. 
So, what kind of dispute was arising and what was settled by the act of settlement that happened in the year 1781? The dispute that arose from the regulating act 1773, one is between the authority of the Governor General Executive Council and the Supreme Court of India, sorry, the Supreme Court of uh, the Kolkata at that point of time in British India. So, they have to resolve this particular conflict because the Supreme Court which was established by the Regulating Act 1773, they exercise jurisdiction including the decisions that is taken by the Governor General and his Executive Council. So, it has created a conflict between the authority of the Governor General Executive Council, so based on which the administration is to be carried out in India at that point of time and what is the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So, one rift was there. So, this has to be clarified. Now, the second issue that this particular act was trying to address is also that the Supreme Court which was established is to carry out the administration of justice. But this administration of justice was to be carried out according to the British legal system, which is very new to the native Indians. And the Indians were not willing to accept the laws and the administration of justice according to the British legal system. And that has created a lot of hardships to the people in our country because mostly they were following their own personal laws. The Muslim people were following their Mohammedan laws. The Hindus were following their Hindu personal laws. So, this act tried to rectify that particular issue and they said that the Supreme Court has to use the personal laws in administering justice to the local people. So, these are the two important things that was taken up by the regulating act or the uh, by, by the act of settlement 1781 or uh, this is exactly what the amendment was envisaged and to sort out all these things that is why it is called as an act of settlement so what is the objective of this act of settlement if you look into the objective of this act of settlement so the first thing is they want to remove the defects in the regulating act 1773 and what are the basic defects one is first they wanted to resolve the conflict between the authority of the Supreme Court and the Governor General Executive Council, which we have just discussed. Second, they wanted to address the native Indian suffering due to administration of justice according to the British legal system and which was very new to the Indians. So, Indians were not able to uh, accept the judgment which is given by the courts according to the British legal system, which is completely new because they have been following their own personal laws. So, these two issues is to be sorted out or to be settled. The British Parliament was very keen in settling these disputes and that is why they wanted to amend the Regulating Act of 1773 and they amended that in the year 1781 and that is why it is called as the Amending Act of 1781 or because the very objective is to settle all these disputes, it is also called as the Act of Settlement. So, what kind of changes has been made in the particular act? So, try to understand this. The provision exempted the Governor General. This is very, very important. So, after the amendment was carried out, the provision exempted the Governor General and the Executive Council. Not only the Governor General were exempted from the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the Executive Council, there were four uh, member Executive Council who advised the Governor General to carry out the administration in India. And also the officials of the company were kept outside the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court cannot question, cannot question or the uh, question the actions of Governor General or the Executive Council of the Governor General or the officials of the government, but strictly in accordance with their official acts. So, whatever they do with regard to their official acts, the Supreme Court cannot question these actions. So, this has been segregated by the Act of Settlement. And also, the revenue matters of the company is completely outside the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So, whatever happens with regard to the revenue, the court cannot question as to why so and so revenue expenditure has happened or whatever is the revenue matter that is beyond the scope of the Supreme Court. And also, the Supreme Court, this act made sure the Supreme Court to take cognizance and consideration of the personal laws while administering the justice and not according to the British legal system. In fact, it was clearly mentioned that the Mohammedan laws has to be taken into account while administering the justice to the Muslims in India and the Hindu personal laws to be taken into account while administering justice to the Hindu people in our country. That is what the Act of Settlement has clearly put forward.
and further if you see the appeals from the provincial courts earlier the appeals from the provincial courts were go to the supreme court the supreme court was made all more powerful but now the jurisdiction of the supreme court has been reduced under this particular act the appeals from the provincial courts to go to the governor general in council and not to the supreme court it will go to the governor general in council and it is a governor general in council who will also frame the rules and regulations to the provincial courts and the councils earlier such rules are to be framed as to how the proceedings shall happen in the court by whom it shall uh, it shall be decided by the supreme court but now it has been given to the governor general in council so if you see that uh, this act of settlement it has taken away uh, powers of the supreme court and in fact uh, the supreme court jurisdiction is only to the entire uh, kolkata not outside kolkata so this is how the uh, legislations have changed some of the earlier provisions under the regulating act of 1773 and then subsequently the legislations did not stop here the next in the series of legislation was the pits india act 1784 so what has happened with regard to the pits india act now pit the younger he is all he is called as so this pit india act was brought in by william pit then the prime minister of britain William Pitt or he is also called as Pitt the Younger. Pitt the Younger because he is the youngest Prime Minister of Britain in the history of Britain. He became the uh, Prime Minister of Britain at the age of 24 years. And uh, he is an able administrator and he wanted to bring in lot of reforms to bring in more efficiency in the administration of the East India Company. and. Uh, for this particular purpose, William Pitt has brought in certain changes in the Regulating Act of 1773 and that came to be what is called as the Pitts India Act. In fact, uh, he found that one of the major reasons as to why the company is not functioning efficiently because both the functions, that is the commercial functions as well as the political and administrative functions are carried out by the Court of Directors and he thought that this should not be the case. And he thought that the efficiency of the East India Company can be increased by providing separate authorities, one authority to look into the commercial function, that is the business activities, and then a separate authority to look into the administration of India, the political functions with regard to administration of India. So earlier, both the functions were carried out by the Court of Directors, and this Court of Directors through the Governor General of Bengal. But Pitts India Act made a change to this. The Pitts India Act said that now the commercial functions will be strictly carried out by whom? The commercial functions will be strictly carried out by the Court of Directors. Court of Directors and the political functions of the company would be carried out by a new authority which is called as Board of Control. Board of Control. And in this way, they thought that they can increase the efficiency of the East India Company. That means what is the very objective of the Spitz India Act? The very objective of the Spitz India Act is for the first time it differentiated between the commercial and the political functions of the company. So the commercial functions are to be carried out by the court of directors who are already there but a new authority has been created is the board of control, a group of people, board of control. Now a board of commissioners in fact they, and they would control the political functions of the company with regard to the administration of the territory in India. So for the first time if you see the Pitts India Act has created a dual system of government or a dual control was created. So one is the court of directors who would carry out the, the, the business activities and then we have the board of control who will carry out the political uh, affairs in the country. And it is the board of control who will control the civil, the military and the revenue aspects of the company henceforth. So in fact the board of control has become more powerful that they would carry out all these activities. And what has happened and the other change that has been brought with regard to the Pitts India Act is it also reduces the size of the executive council of the governor general of Bengal. Because the governor general of Bengal although he is the chief executive officer but he has to act according to the advice which is given by the uh, executive council and with four executive council members the governor general was not having much powers 
because the governor general was to vote only in case of tie otherwise he is not supposed to vote and with four members mostly uh, he has to act in accordance with their direction and he had no control absolutely as to uh, as to what kind of actions they can take despite the fact that he is responsible to the court of directors and the board of control now it was thought that uh, to reduce the size of the executive council so that the decision shall also be taken by the governor general and hence they reduce the size of the uh, executive council to three members so these are the changes that has been brought in by the pits india act now after the pits india act there was the next set of act which is the act of 1786 and after the act of 1786 there were four charter acts that is the charter act of 1793 the charter act of 1813 the charter act of 1833 every successive charter act gave rights to the east india company for another 20 years to carry out their administration in india except for the charter act of 1853 the charter act of 1853 also gave the power to the east india company to carry out its administration in india but without specifying the time period that means sooner or later it is a clear indication that the administration in India will be taken up from the East India Company and yes, it was taken up directly by the British government subsequent to the Government of India Act 1858. So, we will continue with all these topics, but we will do that in the next class because this topic is something which has a lot of information. So, I will make a little shorter videos so that the students can assimilate the information that we discuss in every class. So, let me just quickly summarize as to what we have seen in today's class. So, you understood as to what is the relevance of this particular topic that is the historical background and because the Britishers have ruled India for more than 200 years or approximately around 200 years, but they had their presence in India almost for a period of 350 years and gradually and slowly a lot of constitutional reforms and changes and the representative form of government was introduced by the Britishers starting their company rule which is from 1773 till their 1857 and also during the crown rule from 1858 till 1947 and all these gradual reforms has culminated in the government of india 1935 and the bulk of indian constitution today that we have is also borrowed from the government of india 1935 so the very idea of understanding the various uh, legislations that was passed in by the Britishers is to understand how it resulted in the government of India Act 1935 and the provisions that you have borrowed from the government of India Act 1935 to the Indian constitution. So, after the introduction, we have started understanding the uh, Regulating Act 1773, the first act that was passed by the British uh, Parliament to regulate the affairs of East India Company in our country, and we understood as to what is the reason for that. And the flaws in the Regulating Act of 1773 was uh, amended and it was settled by the Act of Settlement uh, in 1781. And then Pitt the Younger brought in the Pitts India Act to make the system of administration that is East India Company more efficient in nature. And how he was uh, trying to make the administration of East India Company more efficient by bringing in dual system of control and for the first time this dual system of control was introduced or dual government was introduced one is to look into only the commercial activities and other to look into the political activities and the commercial activities would be carried by the court of directors and the political activities would be by the board of control so we'll continue with the remaining acts but we'll do that in the next class so try to watch this particular video and try to uh, read your book and I am sure that you will understand all the things that you have discussed. So, for maximum benefit try to watch all the videos that we have already posted and keep watching the videos and try to uh, put your comments also so that we could improve upon certain things in case if it is really required and all the very best. Thank you very much. God bless. We will meet in the next lecture tomorrow.